welcome to my world. Two escargot, pate, frise, two green salads. Okay, man, it's not here. Lamb chop, steak frites. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two faux filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. And now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I am looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. London, England. Great food isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think of this place. There's a cynicism that surrounds English cuisine. You know, the gray image of boiled meat and potatoes. But London is a city rich in history, culture, and cuisine. From the traditional to the nouvelle, there's a lot of good stuff going on here. And I'm ready to try it all. Okay, there's a phenomena here something that might be terrifying to the American uh, mind and palate, except for those people who eat the Denny's Grand Slam breakfast, of course. This is called the proper English breakfast. For me, a nutritious breakfast before I came here meant, uh, I don't know, around half a pack of cigarettes and a couple of cups of coffee. Never mind the cigarettes. I think the Surgeon General might want to check this out. Savory tart, porridge, meat pies, eggs Benedict. I believe that has hollandaise. Which of bacteria doing the backstroke. I'm sure they make it fresh here regularly, but uh... I'll be going with the classics. The number three. That's the set English breakfast, right? That's everything, yes. Everything. Okay, so it starts out like your basic American breakfast. Fried eggs, slab of bacon, some buttered toast. Yeah, that's still recognizable. But then add grilled tomatoes, bubble, which is the English version of fried potatoes, blood sausage, AKA blood pudding, baked beans, and two big meat sausages, and you've got an entirely different beast. Very well, thank you. Oh yeah, that looks good. This is not even a Titanic version. Usually you get a little bit of sauteed mushroom. Think there's enough starch on here? I don't know, maybe I should get some pancakes on the side. This is the best part, by the way, the, the, the black pudding. Bacon, when you're talking about bacon here, you're talking about uh, the whole smoked loin. It's not just uh, that belly meat like we have. People eat this every day. If you finish your entire breakfast here, you win a brand new Ford Focus. A light but healthy breakfast. Mm. Ready for the gym. All right, I'm not going to the gym, but I am en route to another quintessentially English food joint. We're going to a pie shop. When you're looking for a pie shop, a proper pie shop, a real old school pie shop, you gotta go to the East End. That's where we're going. The F. Cook Pie Shop is about as old school as you can get. The proprietor, Bob Cook, is a fourth generation pie and mash guy. My grandfather got this shop in uh, 1900, but um, my great grandfather started it all in 1862. You won't find apples or blueberries in these pies. Nope, it's all about meat. And in the old days, eel. My father and grandfather used to make eel pies. Eels were very, very cheap. They were like a staple diet of the East Ender and, 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 and Londoners. But then eels became more expensive, like anything, so it's faded out and the meat pie's taken over. Thank God, no eel. Bring on the meat pie. This is where we make the pies. These are proper dishes that my grandfather had made about 80 or 90 years ago. Right, there's the meat, which is uh, fresh beef that we get from Smithfield, which is our meat market, every week. Like any great pie, it's the dough that's key. A little bit of flour and pour your gauge in. It's a delicate balance between flour, water, margarine, and the podger. This bit of dough is your podger. You've got to make an imprint so that the meat can go in. So, you podge it. You go one, two, and that is your podger. Once you've podged, you're ready for the meat filling. On go the tops and then into the oven. This is the hot plate where we do our potatoes. A pie just isn't a pie without a side of mash. And then there's the fluorescent gravy. In tradition in our, our trade, it's called liquor. This liquor is made of fresh parsley and a special batter mixture. The cooked pies are screaming to be eaten. Let's get it on. 
There's your salt pepper. Beautiful. Old school pie and mash. The pastry shell is light and the meat filling's hearty. Oh, and that's good. What I'm going to do with your eels, I think you've got another potato there. I'll just do your eels in liquor. Perfect. And otherwise you'll blow your, yeah. blow your bags out. OK. All right. Eels? Who said anything about eels? And what's this about blowing out my bags? Hmm. Stewed eels and parsley liquor with a splash of chili vinegar. I'm all for a traditional English lunch, but after a proper English breakfast, it's a bit much. It's Bones? I guess I can live with them. This ain't half bad. They're good for you. High in protein, vitamins A and D, it's a health platter. Fit for a princess. Regular customer, I hear she ain't here all the time. This is a dish I could get used to. nonsense about London always being rainy and bad weather. <laughs> Who are they kidding? Every time I come here, it's beautiful. From the East End to the West End, there's a lot of energy in London, and at times, a lot of tourists doing that tourist thing. Sure, I'm a tourist, but my rubbernecking interests lay elsewhere. I mean, I love my country and all that, but when I leave my country, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hear an Indiana accent next to me, okay? I'm headed off to one of those places that typically isn't on the tour bus route. We're in Smithfield, that's the meat district of London, with the awesome Fergus Henderson, who's a chef and uh, operator of just about my favorite restaurant in the universe. St. John, which specializes in all those strange and unfashionable cuts of meat that were once commonplace in rural England. Old school, use every part of the animal. Innards and extremities, there's much goodness to be found there. The good stuff, and we're gonna see plenty of that. So we're headed to Smithfield Meat Market to check out some of that good stuff. And like Fergus, I'm all about the innards. Oftentimes, that's where the tastiest parts are. Some throat, the lungs, the liver. It's sort of like uh, an itchy and scratchy when they yank Scratchy's whole guts out. That's it. It's all good, man. And it's only going to get better in Fergus's kitchen. This restaurant is about traditional English cuisine. And, and sort of rediscovering what has always been good in England. And traditionally, tribes, and chitlings, trotters, who's all been part of British regional food, but somehow we seem to have uh, fallen in love with the fillet. But here at St. John, Fergus is igniting interest beyond the delights of the fillet. Broad beans, trotter. OK, that's pig's foot, the broad beans. Trotter's a foot. See a little skin there. A little lean, a little fat. So it's like ham with lovely bits of nice, little fatty, wonderful, chewy bits. I never got it before. Oh, yeah. All right, I can't pig out. I got more coming. I generally don't like pig's feet. That was really good. Next up, roasted bone marrow. It's all about the fatty tissue inside the bone. Doesn't need any fancy prep, just a good, slow roast. The finished bones are plated with a few slices of grilled country bread and a parsley salad, and it's ready to serve. Oh, yeah. This is probably my favorite thing in the whole world to eat. Look at that. Oh, my God. And this is what you do. You just scrape all that good stuff out there, all that good marrow, a little sea salt, a little piece of toast. It's simple and it's austere. Bone marrow tastes like the butter of the gods. See, this is real luxury. The ingredient speaks for itself. This is the perfect food stuff. This is it. I could push away from the table right now as a happy man, but Fergus isn't done with me just yet. Ox hearts. The heart sort of has the essence of the beast. They all have fantastic flavor. All right, this is ox heart with a beet salad and a horseradish sauce. Oh, that's great. Really traditional old English. What does ox heart taste like? Really tender steak, really tender. It's not livery, it's not organy, it's just meaty good. I love this. Oh, man. Next up, the heart and soul of St. John. Oh, it just gets better and better. Pig's tail and pig's head. Is there anything lovelier? It's sort of our motto, no, at least, yes. 
The pig's tails are breaded and pan fried. The head is braised with onions. It's a lovely middle white head. The middle white pig. Fit for a king. We've got the nose and we've got the tail. And I've eaten just about everything in between. Look at this. The cheek is, of course, one of the most delightful segments. Oh. Now, I haven't had this yet. This is a new experience entirely, the pig's tail. All right, no one's looking. This is just amazing. It's the perfect balance of, of lean and fat. This is it. This is what food used to be about, and hopefully what it will be about in the future. Just filled with admiration for this guy. This is a chef who understands. This is a guy who took a stand and just said, you know, what they said. I'm gonna set up a shop, and I'm gonna do what's good, and people will go out of their way to find it and eat it. And of course, he's right. As a former colony of the British Empire, India has made an indelible impression on English cuisine. The food is much beloved here. So I hook up with my friend Mona and her mom, Saroj. They've offered to make me a home-cooked Punjabi meal. So we're off to do a little shopping. Let's see what we can do. For me, these markets are like a trip to a foreign shore. For others, it's home. Oh, I've been coming here for the last 30 years. This market is a refreshing combination of the familiar. This is jackfruit. Seen this in Vietnam. The unfamiliar. These are karela. It's really bitter. I hated this as a child. It's a very acquired taste. And the bizarrely unknown. I think this is a fruit. This unusual looking fruit is called rambutan. It's really beautiful. Very exotic and erotic. They're sweet and delicious. It's like a lychee. Oh, good. Mm. Let's get the lamb. We're going to make a lamb curry. So we're going to probably buy a shoulder of lamb. You're looking for a nice mix of uh, fat and lean. And have it cut into cubes. Curry is just an English word for Indian food. I mean, a lot of in Indian food you have in England is sort of suited to the English palate. A lot was lost in translation during Eng English occupation. The food's so different to what you'd have in a restaurant. OK. Back at her flat, Mona and her mom waste no time getting to work. In the company of these two, I feel utterly useless. <laughs> Need some minced onions or something? I happen to be very good at that. Yeah. Keep me uh, assigned to the menial tasks, though. While I'm earning my keep chopping garlic, Saroj gets started on our first dish, lamb kebabs. It begins with the freshly minced meat of a two-year-old lamb, also known as mutton. Then add cilantro, ginger, breadcrumbs, and a number of spices. Cloves, cinnamon, cardamom. This is a northern Indian cooking. The chili is not predominant with our cooking. Think about chili, though, isn't it? Even though you're dying, you, you still, need more. You still want more. You go back. It's like a bad man. <laughs> Glad I could help with the garlic, but I'm way outclassed in this kitchen. So I clean up and make for the exit. And I'm suddenly brought face to face with the strange and horrible. Do you ever cook in a pressure cooker? Never. I'm terrified of them. I just I hear I heard the word and it was I, I start moving away like this. People can use them safely. Or I've just never, ever used one in my life. Um, but I can't do without it. I'll be watching from over here. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's got their phobias, and I'm not afraid to admit pressure cookers scare the crap out of me. Sounds like a torture device. I don't know about you, but this is one chef that needs a smoke. <sighs> That's fine tobacco. Unfazed by the terrors of the pressure cooker, Mona goes to work on her curry spices. So whenever I cook a curry, I always make everything fresh, and I always toast them. It just gives it a nice flavor. After the cumin and coriander seeds are roasted, they're ground. This is all the spices. Next, onions, garlic, and ginger are sautéed in butter. And then you put the spices in, and chili. Red chili I use. Meanwhile, Saroj continues to work on the kebabs. Ooh, it smells good. Yes. That's going to be great. It should be all right, yes. The meat's gone in. The yeah. lamb, the shoulder of lamb, 
and it's cubed up with the bone because the bone has all the flavour. Some people do the tomatoes before, but I always do them after. If you do too many tomatoes, it tastes like an Italian stew or something. A kind of curried tomato stew. While the lamb curry cooks, Mona goes to work on the raita, a creamy cucumber side dish. We add yogurt to this a bit. Before that, I'm going to make sure the kebabs don't burn. Oops, my kebabs. Oh. The kebabs come out cooked to perfection, and the appetizers are served. It smells good. This is for chili fiends. It's, I think, the best chili chutney. You can eat it with any Indian food. Oh, yeah. The kebabs are delicious, and I decide the best way I can help is to keep working on the premium lagers and let Mona get back to finishing the raita. This is just yogurt but with cucumber, and it's really refreshing. It's really important to have it with Indian food because it's very cooling. You're good at this. You can take my job, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sarosh starts the vegetable dishes, beginning with an okra and onion dish called Lady Fingers. If you put lemon in that, it doesn't get sticky. Sticky will just burn off. The next item is gobi aloo. Cauliflower and potato. A traditional Punjabi dish made with a mix of different spices. We put a little bit of garlic, red chilies, cumin seed and coriander seeds. This is home cooking and I'm ready to eat. It smells good. Finally, the moment arrives and dinner is served. Why is Indian food so popular in England? It's got a flavor. Uh, garlic, ginger, onion and cinnamon, cloves, everything together. It seems to occupy a really special place in, in, in British cuisine. It's so opposite, though, to English food, isn't it? It's like mm -hmm. completely, it's the other extreme of a palate. And I think that's what it is. You know, you yeah. want what's so different to what you know. That's true. There's something to say about the English palate, that it's open to foreign taste. And this meal is one magnificent taste after another. Cheers. Cheers, and thank you. Wonderful. This is for the, for the real treat. Generally, I'm not a submissive sort of a guy, but there are a few times in your life when you know you're about to have a great time, you're about to have a great meal, and just give yourself over completely to the experience. And that's what I'm about to do at the fearsome, the terrifying, the awesome Gordon Ramsay's restaurant. Eating lots of sugar this morning. Oh, yes, sir. Good. Are we seeing you Monday? On a left, table seats. Gordon Ramsay is considered to be the best chef in England. End of story. That's nice. He's operating at a pitch and at a level that requires nothing but excellence. <laughs> nice. Famously abrasive and brilliantly talented. Stop. Big, dirty, grease, poor mark on there. Can you see that? The bar, Ambala. He's not a name brand. He's a hands-on chef. One consomme, one ham hock at the same time. I'm going to do it with you, OK? When there are moments when you know you're about to get a really good meal. This is one of them. Come on, let's get him. Gordon begins the meal with a ham hock terrine on top of celery yak, or celery root. To complement the terrine, a chilled consomme with caviar. Oh, thank you. This is what they call an amuse go. Sort of an amusement for the mouth. Something to wake you up for the for the meal. Oh, that's lovely. Mm. Superb. The sharp, acidic. Uh, often the thing that will follow is a little more subtle. It's a pain in the ass to make a great consomme, but Gordon's done it. The caviar only makes it that much better. Oh, there they are. Look at that little fish eggs floating around in there. Oh, yeah, baby. Really, really, really extraordinary. So I'm off to a good start. Next up, a lobster ravioli on a bed of pea puree with truffles, white asparagus, and lobster vinaigrette. And finish with a sweet pea vinaigrette. Lovely. You have a hard time believing this from me. The peas, the baby peas, are so extraordinary. When you go to vegetables, it just speaks so loudly to me. You're doing God's work. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Phil, we're sending uh, Tony Bourdain's um, main course now. And this is a beautiful um, chin of beef. Um, chin of beef has been braised for three and a half to four hours in the oven with lots of red wine and a huge mirepoix of vegetables. And it's served on a bed of new season spinach with wonderful grated truffle. That's topped with the most sumptuous, decadent slice of sauté foie Stunning. That should stuff him. But knowing him, he's like a f***ing horse, so I'm sure he'll find room somewhere. Merci, monsieur. Oh, my God. Look how the beef breaks. Oh, yeah. This is too good. A little black truffle right here. That looks extraordinary. 
foie gras, seared foie gras. I defy you to find a veg vegetarian restaurant who treats spinach as respectfully as it has been treated in this dish. He's walking that tightrope between perfect and overkill. I like that. This is one of the best things I've eaten ever. But I want to know what he's going to do for dessert. And that would be a wild strawberry gelée with ice cream. Just ask for perfection. Oh, man, look at this. Oh. What it is is so unbelievable. These are these tiny little wild strawberries and a micro julienne of uh, orange zest. This is incredible. So it's about alternately inflaming and cooling passions. It's really extraordinary. My trip to London has been an enlightening experience. Today's British cuisine embraces traditions that are the best of both old and new. Classic puddings, enjoy them.